and tell you about what's going on in DC and also what he's been working on in the district. And then you have all submitted, or if you, if you want to, uh, questions, and they go in a bucket. Uh, those questions will be randomly set up, selected out of the bucket. I just pick them out, and we'll just go around the room, and whoever's question gets picked will ask those questions. And we're scheduled to be here for about an hour, um, so please welcome the Congressman. Well, thank you for having me. I um, took over. Okay. Well, thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. That's very nice. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, it's kind of nice for me because uh, Thinsville is my hometown. I guess we're uh, right across the Division Street in Mequon. But glad to be here. I think it's the first office hours I've had in Thinsville, so Mequon. I remember many times as a state senator, I showed up with uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner. I think he had his office hours here at Mequon uh, over in the City Hall, and I don't think he ever had a turnout like this. So thank you for making me feel welcome. Uh, like I said, I grew up in Thinsville, and uh, my mom still lives there. Um, I'm Randy Abnell. It was really good. I um, want to talk a little bit. Um, as you know, this is kind of the southeast corner of my district. The district now goes all the way up Lake Michigan, north of Two Rivers. It goes across the middle of the state all the way over to Wisconsin Dells. The biggest cities in the district are Oshkosh, Sheboygan, Mena, Fond du Lac, and Manitoba. Um, but of course, sentimentally, this is kind of an area I like to be. We have with me, by the way, today, Jim Ott, a wonderful assembly. Questions are going to be picked out at random, but if any of the questions involve state issues, we'll let Jim on answer the questions. Uh, as far as what's going on in Washington right now, I want to just touch base on a couple of things. I am on three committees. I'm on the Education and Workforce Committee, the Budget Committee, and the Government Oversight Committee. We have actually done more in Congress than I think people are aware of as far as their volume bills that have, uh, the President Trump signed in the first three months. It was more than his contemporaries have signed. Um, in, the, in the House of Representatives, um, usually on a bipartisan basis, we have passed 15 bills on doing regulations that were done in the waning months of the Obama presidency. It is one of the few things Congress can accomplish with only 51 votes in the U.S. Senate. Uh, since that law went into effect, there's only been one other time which Congress has undone a, undone a regulation of a prior president. So we've done a lot more of that uh, than other people have said. There are certain areas in which we have focused on and have passed laws out of the House of Representatives. I am on the Education Committee, and we are doing what we can to allow more flexibility for local, uh, local states and localities to pass laws, uh, making it easier on the education end of things for people to get skills-based training. As you perhaps are aware, we have a lot of kids today or adults taking out big student loans and spending time in education is not leading to jobs. Nevertheless, as I get up around my district, particularly the manufacturing areas, there is a huge shortage of people for in the skills-based area, be it manufacturing, be a construction. So I'm glad we're moving the ball in that direction. That is one thing we've gotten out of the House of Representatives. We've also passed several bills dealing with um, preventing future presidents from bringing in regulations which are doing honors to business. Uh, as you know, a lot of times what is done in administrative agencies, be it the Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Labor, whatever, can be more expensive to the public than actual spending bills passed by Congress. Uh, we have also taken up seven bills dealing with human trafficking. For whatever reason, this has become a larger and larger problem around our country, and I'm glad to be part of that. Um, we are also working on things on the Education Committee dealing with student loan debt. Right now, I'm sure everybody in the room knows people with high student loans, people with big loans in their 30s and 40s. 
I think there are a variety of things we can do to prevent that from happening in the future. I would like to have colleges and universities have to sign off. Yes. Got to be louder, okay. Um, colleges and universities sign off on loans in the future. There is evidence that sometimes young people take out loans, not necessarily for academic reasons, but for lifestyle reasons. We are told that some universities and colleges would stop that, which is good. It's a lot easier to take out a big loan when you're 18 years old to have a little more fun uh, than it is to repay that loan when you're 35 or 40 years old. I'd like to believe I'll be able to get that done if we are able to pass something with regard to um, student loan debt. It's something that's going to be a little bit more difficult, but I want to begin to get the idea out there. I wouldn't mind if like 10% of the student loan debt, the universities or the educational institutions were on the hook for that as well. I think if colleges and universities know that they were on the hook for repaying maybe 10% of the loans, they would be a little bit more careful about how they handle the students, a little bit more aggressive in making sure those students got jobs, maybe a little bit more aggressive in making sure that people didn't go down academic pathways that they weren't going to succeed at anyway. As far as big things that we expected to do and haven't done yet, I'll give you my opinions on them in general. As you know, we anticipated repealing or replacing Obamacare. I personally voted on two plans in that regard. I realized we're going to have to compromise to get things done. I voted on one plan in the House Budget Committee, and I voted another plan on the floor of the House. That plan just barely passed. I don't like labeling politicians, but of the 20 politicians that voted against the bill that came out of the House of Representatives, 17 would have been considered more moderate, and three would, would have been considered more conservative. But we just barely got a bill out of the House. It then went to the Senate, as you're probably aware, because we have more informed people here, um, three senators voted against what would have really been just a placeholder bill to keep the idea of repealing Obamacare alive. Um, all three of those senators, I think, we would put them up in the uh, moderate category. I was disappointed that the Senate did not follow up further on that regard. John McCain was the surprise vote that night. I happened to be in the Senate that night watching uh, cast a no vote on that provision. I know the Trump administration wanted to keep the idea alive. Mike Pence was over there talking to John McCain uh, within the final hour before he cast the vote. John McCain said he voted no, not because he didn't like the idea of repealing Obamacare, but he didn't like the fact that they had hearings, and he didn't like the fact that he didn't have a congressional budget office, office estimate. I personally believe Mitch McConnell that night, if he really wants to repeal Obamacare, would have said, okay, John McCain, um, we will have some committee hearings, we will get some budget office estimates, and we'll be back next month to take this vote again. He did not do that, which I think is wrong. Um, ultimately, something is going to have to be done along these lines. There are many counties around the country which already have only one insurer involved in the uh, Obamacare exchanges. Obviously, the plan cannot work with one insurer. There are going to be some counties that have no insurance at all. So ultimately, Congress is going to have to do something. I am disappointed that Mitch McConnell, however, did not immediately say we're going to work on something to try to try hard. Try to try to get to our, our 50 votes. So I also am a little disappointed that the House and the Senate are not working together. Right now the plan is because the House passed something, it's now the Senate's turn. And one of many frustrating things that goes on in Washington, I do not think the House and Senate act together enough. I spent many years in Madison, and in Madison, as Jim and I know because we served together, it was common for the senators and the assemblymen to work together and get things done. For whatever reason, there is not, I believe, enough communication in Washington between the Senate and the House, and this idea that the Senate should come up with their plan and the House should come up with their plan, and they don't be in the same room together. It's just a, a ridiculous mistake, but uh, that's the system I deal with right now. And when I return to Washington a week from tomorrow, I will weigh in one more time and say that the House and Senate ought to be working together. With regard to tax reform, I know people are disappointed we don't have tax reform done yet, but given the way things work in Washington, it is not surprising. For most things in Washington, 
you cannot get them done without 60 votes in the Senate. While I try to work with Democrats a lot and pride myself on my bipartisanship, it is sometimes difficult to get certain things done on a bipartisan basis. In order to be able to pass tax reform, you have to go through a process called reconciliation, which is something you do at the same time you pass a budget. Um, we have not passed a budget yet. At the time we pass a budget, we will believe we will put together instructions such that we will be able to do some sort of tax plan with 51 votes in the Senate, which means we'll be able to get it done. There are two ways to get done the plan. One is if you don't cut taxes, but just change tax and make them simpler, you will be able to pass that one for 51 votes in the Senate and make it permanent. If you actually want to cut taxes, and this is what happened under the Bush administration, that tax cut can only be good for 10 years. There has not been a detailed tax plan presented so far, but there has been a House Ways and Means plan, and there has been a Trump plan, you know, rough outline of what the plan would look like. Um, I have some problems with both of them, but until I've seen all the details, I can't comment at length. Uh, I do believe it is important that the tax plans be aimed at the middle class. I think in our society, you know, the very wealthy are not in bad shape, but we have to make sure that the taxes do not um, adversely affect or affect the way they are doing business. And it's very important that we lower the top corporate rates so we're more in line with the rest of the world. We do not want companies with manufacturing in other countries because our tax is going to high. We also want to make sure that uh, right now in this country, big corporations sit on money abroad, including even Puerto Rico. We want those companies to be able to bring that money back in the United States. Right now they are investing that money abroad because we have a huge, what they call, repatriation tax. Uh, we believe we need to get more money or reduce, reduce the amount of repatriation tax because right now we're getting you know, very little of it at all. So those are things that have to be done. But like I said, my concern on the tax plan is it has to be in the middle class. Right now we do take care of people who are not working as hard as they should. And uh, obviously the wealthy are very wealthy. I think both the initial Trump plan and the, uh, the Ways and Means plan were a little bit embarrassing. And that I don't think they, they did enough to target the average guy. And I'm laying on both those. I was glad to see that Donald Trump personally Waited and said, said he was disappointed with the House plan. So hopefully things will work out for the better there. The other major thing I would like to see accomplished this biennium is something about welfare reform. That is also something that we have to pass a budget on uh, to be able to accomplish with 51 votes in the Senate. I have at different times been led by my leadership team to think of this something we're going to do this year and next year. I think it's very important to do it this year because controversial things are hard to get done in a legislative body in an election year. So it's important that we deal with welfare reform right now and I would like to see more vocal statements from our Republican officials and leadership. So there's a little bit of what, what's going on. Um, I am going back to Washington a week from tomorrow, the day after Labor Day. Uh, the job in general is three weeks in Washington, one week back home. I do come back home every week, but the exception is August. I am back for the entire month of August, not only having these town hall meetings, but I tour a lot of factories in the district, tour a lot of festivals, and try to meet as many people as I can. So thank you all for being here and giving us such a wonderful turnout. Now we have some, Rachel's going to pull. Carol Ross. Turquoise bucket. If you could just read your question. Please pass legislation that helps poor people and women. I am concerned about health care and the environment. I do try to, uh, you know, try to do what I can. I work as hard as I can to make sure we improve America. America is still the enemy of the world. We know that because everybody trying to get in here. So we got a great country going. But uh, I will do what I can, particularly with regard to the kids, because I know a lot of people right now are afraid that things aren't going to be as good for their kids. 
as they have been for people in the past. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I usually try to focus on children and how, how legislation I vote on today is going to look kind of funny. I don't think that answers your question. She said she wanted me to pass legislation that favors for women and children. And I, I do, when I look at legislation, I always try to have legislation that, that improves America. Joe Weingold? What, sorry. Not, no, baby. Did Washington ever hear of the word compromise? <laughs> Successful companies, organizations, even family, a husband and wife, there's got to be give and take. And uh, it seems both parties are on the extreme end, and it's my way or your way. Um, as I mentioned, with regard to the Obamacare situation, I voted for two compromise plans. Um, however, there's a lot more compromise in Washington. As I mentioned, for the vast majority of things, they do not get out of the Senate without 60 votes. Which means, even though he's in the minority, Chuck Schumer, the very left-wing senator from New York, has veto power over almost anything. When we passed what is called an appropriation bill, but I think you would maybe consider it the budget for the fiscal year ending September 30th, we could not get that done without at least eight votes in the Democrat Senate, which means Chuck Schumer sat at the table and he had to approve everything that's in it. In my first two years in Congress, we had the most significant transportation bill in years. We had the most significant Medicare reform bill in years. Um, we had an omnibus bill which, fund, which uh, funded the government for the first full year that I was there. We had a, a bill giving back local control and education that I was part of on the Education Committee. Those were four significant bills. The, the, some of the bills were the most significant <coughs> bills we've seen in their topic area for years. They were all entirely bipartisan. As a matter of fact, one of the differences, for better or worse, in Congress compared to the state legislature because the 60 rule in the Senate, because the 60 rule in the Senate, um, the vast majority of things are bipartisan and they have to be bipartisan. When we pass the appropriation bills, which will fund the government beginning October 1st, unless the Senate changes its rules, and I don't see the senators changing their rules, they will all be bipartisan. So therefore, I have to stop and wonder, why do people always think that everything in Washington is so partisan? And I think it is, because if we pass something on a bipartisan basis, <coughs> You don't get the quotes from Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi disagreeing with each other. They just pass, right? They pass 305 to 115 or something or other, and there's no big hoopla. There are some things in which the part, in which the political parties <coughs> fundamentally disagree. Okay, I think it is accurate to say in general on most lines of the budget, except for arguably defense. Oh, all the Democrats voted for a. A defense bill I thought was a little bit too big spending anyway. But uh, on almost every line, the Democrats will believe that we should spend more. That's fine. They're, they're entitled to their opinion, but that's that's fine. I think most Republicans are quicker to run on a platform of we should balance the budget. So when you look for compromise, you really have people going kind of in the opposite directions in the first place. The same thing when it comes to government regulation. I think maybe Republicans spend more time talking to businessmen. When you talk to the variety of regulatory agencies or talk to farmers, uh, you get complaints of sometimes a lack of common sense and excessive amount of paperwork going with, with regulation. I think if you look at the Democrats and the position they take on the floor, they feel quite frankly we're not regulated enough. And it's harder to comp. Some of that is not just I won't get along. You have people pulling in the exact opposite direction. If they're pulling in the exact opposite directions, it's hard to say, well, we'll both give them half of what they want. Because maybe one person wants to spend $100 million less than the other one. Wants to spend more. But there is a lot more bipartisanship in Washington. Than you think. And the other thing I'll say is, we largely get along. I mean, you know, I, I, I questionably think that we're spending too much money in Washington. 
Um, I unquestionably think we're over-regulated in Washington. I unquestionably think the welfare system is out of control. But I get along with the Democrats personally. You know, we chit-chat in the morning. Uh, when, they, you know, when I go downstairs, get dressed for the day. We chit-chat on the floor of the house and give a turn on C-SPAN. They love to come up to me and talk to me about how the Packers are doing, or what's the weather at home, or what did you do on August break. So we get along very well. There are just fundamental differences in which way we feel the, well, the government's going. And by the way, I'll tell you something else. We are broke out of our mind. Uh, we are now 60, uh, we are $20 trillion in debt, about $60,000 60, in debt for every man, woman, and child in the country. One of the major reasons we're so in debt is a lot of bipartisanship. In other words, the easiest way to get together an appropriation bill is give every congressman something that they want. And by the time they give them all what they want, they pass the bill and everybody stands up and cheers for being bipartisan. So sometimes bipartisanship can be very expensive. That's something to remember before you want too much bipartisanship. As a matter of fact, usually the cost of bipartisanship is more of taxpayers' money. Mark Mittenthal? Yes. Uh, can everybody hear me, by the way? Yeah. A little better. Yeah. Better. Right. Yeah. You don't raise your hand. We used to have these things that people come carrying signs. and really nobody has signs today. Of course, <laughs> well, thanks for coming today and inviting everybody in the district, unlike uh, the, the way the Speaker of the House does business. Well, the Speaker of the House is a little more hoopla. He's third in line. Well, we appreciate your coming. It appears that the Democratic Party wants affordable health care for all, and Obamacare was an attempt to do that. Where the Republican Party only seems interested in repealing Obamacare. They've had seven years to come up with a plan, and they can't come up with a plan. Well, I'll comment on them both. People say, you had seven years to come up with a plan. Why didn't you just get in there and pass a plan? There are 52 member, Republican members of the U.S. Senate, and they've got to get 50 of those people on board. And you have some Republicans who feel, I have some sympathy there, that they feel the whole reason we have a health care problem in this country is the government already is doing too much. As the government plays around in health care, the cost goes up. You have other people who feel that anybody who's got government coverage right now shouldn't lose coverage. So are Republicans kind of pulling in opposite directions. And therefore, it's not surprising that it's hard to get 50 out of the 52 Republicans on board in the Senate. The Democrats did it for um, Obamacare. Yep. They got yeah. 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 Yes, they yeah. did. Illegal. They're in control of everything. They don't want to use this anymore. So in the Republican Party, we have more of a, you know, <laughs> a broad base. <laughs> the problem with saying health care is not. That's just very funny. Um, did, did I, um, if you're going to say health care for all, it in a way says the government has to run the health care system. Right. Yes, and right. the government runs things. They frequently do do all that. Okay. Medicare, Social Security, our fathers came true because they want to be free. There are areas. Healthcare related areas in which the government has been very little involved. An example would be cosmetic surgery, which, after all, is done by doctors and medical institutions. Over time, the cost of cosmetic surgery has fallen, and you will see many more advertisements for cosmetic surgery today than you did 20 years ago. And you could argue that is because the government's not involved. People who want the government to run all the rest of the health care have to recognize that if they do, you're going to wind up a situation like, let's say, Canada, where people frequently come to this country to have things done because it's done better here, or it's done without a waiting list. Okay. I do not believe you that it is best off to have the government run our massive health care system. Any more than I think it would be good to say you have to buy an automobile from the government, though most of you probably drove here today, or that you have to buy food from a government store. 
even though you didn't get food from a government store. The reason we are a wealthy, wonderful country is because we are a free country, in addition to the benefits of freedom in its own right, a free enterprise system over time results like in greater goods, or in this case, greater, better medical mm -hmm. services, for less cost. Now, right now, I don't think people are focusing enough on the cost of medical care. And, the re and medical care costs have gone up to a certain extent because of all the government involvement that's already there. As much as you want to, as much as I appreciate your opinion, I think you need to appreciate your constituents' opinions. Well, I have a, I, I, yes. Yes. Representing Did us. Did you sign up? Did well, you sign up? Well, I, I walked in late. I wasn't able yeah, to. I will try to answer as many questions as I can. It is unfair to the people who are playing kind of by the rules if I respond to people who ask questions by just throwing something out. So I will try to get through to as many people as I can. I do listen to my constituents. I am out and about around my district all the time and, and get, their, get their comments. But like I said, I think if you look at all the areas in our society in which government is not involved, the two major areas that are involved are secondary education and health care, but all the other areas, we have so much choice, we have things that the whole rest of the world wants to get here. And to say that we do not want free principles or free market principles involved in health care, to me, what free market has done so wonderfully well and all the other things you spend money on, is a little bit. No. Healthcare is not a commodity. It's life itself. Okay. Roy Brubeck? That's a huge generalization. Roy Brubeck? Roy Brubeck is over here in the red. Yes. Why, and I can already hear Jim, thank you. I can already hear the response. Why does it appear that the Republicans are in the ability to support Trump? You wondered why Republicans are not supporting Trump more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a follow. On which issue are you? How about the most recent one? The Paul Ryan um, couldn't resist making a comment on it. There are, again, the Republican Party is not a, a monolith. Um, I think Donald Trump is doing a very good job on regulatory reform. I've been very outspoken there. We, the rules in the Senate require 60 votes, so as far as getting things done, uh, there are individual things that Donald Trump wants done. He's going to have a hard time getting done. Uh, but, and there are some people who I think honestly didn't want him to win the primary and haven't gotten over it so far. Um, I think Donald Trump, as I mentioned just a second ago, has weighed in that he wants the tax proposals in Congress to be more middle class oriented. And I've been very outspoken and agree with Donald Trump there. But there are other people who I hopefully eventually change their position a little bit. Um, otherwise, I'll publicly say I think he tweets too much. I mean, that, that's one thing that I publicly disagree with him on. I've, I've only met with him once for about two minutes since he was sworn in, and I told him that, so that's not a secret. Um, but otherwise, I think his, <coughs> I've been very outspoken that I think his budget is more responsible than one that's going to come out of Congress. I think a lot of Republican congressmen want to spend more money than Donald Trump does. That's all fine and good to spend other people's money, but some are going to run out of other people's money. So I, I, I prefer the frugality of Donald Trump compared to the Congress collectively, and I made that clear. Um, you speak louder, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but I do think a lot of Republican politicians do want to spend more money than Donald Trump proposed. Donald Trump proposed a 5.5% increase in military spending. A lot of members of Congress wanted to go over 11%, in part because of people like me, they're holding it to 9.5%. Um, why they would stick with Donald Trump and what General Mattis said at the time of 5.5%, I don't know. You'd have to look in their mind. Um, on Obamacare, I know President Trump 
wants to do something. But as has been said, it, as I pointed out, it's hard to get 50 out of 52 people, yeah, Republicans in the Senate on board, and it might have to be a much more bipartisan <coughs> line. Uh, I like what Donald Trump did on taxes. I like what he did on regulation. I like his court appointments. I think I am uh, pleased with him on all those issues. I think on, on all those issues, I think he's doing a better job than, say, either Bush would have done. <laughs> so uh, those are kind of my comments. And as far as Republicans who can't get with the program, like I said, I don't, I don't know. There were certainly a lot of Republicans who endorsed him very reluctantly in the first place who didn't endorse him. And I think a lot of people like that, maybe they, they don't like to admit they were wrong. Marissa Grissman? Yeah, right here. <coughs> Hi, this is a question I have lost sleep over. I am deeply concerned with Donald Trump being able to launch a nuclear strike without any clear thinking person having the power to stop him. I think he's clear thinking, and I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think like all presidents, as far as individual decisions are made, if you get there, you're not an expert on everything. I'm not an expert. I'm just a member of the population. Could you, you speak up again? Other, speak up. Speak up. You have many side. other people who advise you, and he has a top flight administration around him, um, which helps him make a variety of decisions. I think, I think his rebuilding of the military will make us safer overall. Like I said, proposed a five and a half percent increase. I think he's going to wind up signing a budget with a bigger than a five and a half percent increase. And if you do talk to members of the military, which I do, and I'm sure maybe you know next door neighbors or you know niece or nephews or something in the military, I think they will tell you that the world is going to be a safer place under Donald Trump's defense budgets and the defense budgets have been passed the last six months. Ed Crowther. Ed? Yep. Good question. Mm -hmm. Are you Ed? I'm Ed. Oh, good. Okay. Um, question, uh, one question was, what has happened to the investigation of the IRS, which was targeting conservative groups? I saw in the Wall Street Journal just in the past week that, that nothing has been done and, that, and nobody um, is... The committee that was in charge of these investigations, I am on, the Government Oversight Committee, the chairman of that committee, who I think was a dynamo and did so many investigations on so many different things, left. Just shocked everybody one day up and said I'm retiring from college. We have a uh, Jason Chaffins was his name. Uh, Trey Gowdy is his replacement. I think Trey is up and going. Uh, one of the last things we did under Jason Chaffins is we had a hearing on Fast and Furious, which is a scandal that every school child should know about but doesn't. Um, and I other members of the committee are encouraging Trey to be as aggressive as Jason Chaffin says. And the IRS is one thing where we shouldn't stop until we get more information to who was involved. I, I think Fast and Fierce was even worse, but there's no shortage of scandals in the past. Um, we know that uh, a past spouse of a, of a cabinet secretary got substantial <coughs> speaking fees that may have affected U.S. policy. I'd like to have us look at that sometimes. Who was that? Who was the wife of the cabinet member? And what cabinet member the was the husband? I know the spouse, husband. but who was the husband? He's Clinton back. His name was, his initials were oh. WJC. Janet Cabot? <laughs> <laughs> <Kevin's laughs> she was president. Janet? Janet? Hannah Howenstein? Yeah. Yeah. Do you need your card? Yeah, because I have a lot of things yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Sorry. Sorry. Um, well, moving, a lot of the topics that I had concerns about were already addressed. 
but I'd like to know your position on the hate mongering and racism that's being brought to the forefront by the president today. Of this racism and hate mongering. Uh, we just had a president who had Al Sharpton in the White House over hate mongering. Obviously, for those of you who are not familiar with Al Sharpton, you go home, you can Google Al Sharpton. And we are here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I yeah. felt yeah. that some people apparently feel that they benefit by being divisive and not bringing people together. I think um, we have got to bring Americans together. I think the uh, current president is trying to do that. Inheriting the difficult situation. I don't think you're going to see the Al Sharptons of the world in light of the White House. I don't think said he wanted, they would have said he wasn't defending the First Amendment. If he goes against them, then they, they, they bring up the negative every time, single time. The second thing I have a question. I didn't hear your first sentence, I'm sorry. Oh, the battering of Just President Trump. Um, constantly in the press. Um, okay. um, she's worried about the huge amount of Trump battering. It is apparent, and I don't watch much TV, but it is apparent that overwhelming majorities of people who determine what we see on television and the newspapers really, really don't like Donald Trump. And uh, I don't know why that is. <laughs> situation that he's in. It is obviously scary for our country that when somebody really hasn't even done a lot so far, hasn't had a chance to do a lot so far, um, engender such dislike from the media. I mean, when I was a child, and maybe it was bad then too, and I just didn't realize it, but you know, I'd subscribe to Newsweek magazine, and I'd listen to NBC or CBS. When I got home at night, I was kind of a geeky guy like that. <coughs> and I thought I was getting the facts, and I could rely on those. And right now, I don't feel that, um, which is unfortunate. And I suppose you could say part of it stems from the schools of journalism. I, from top, from sometimes you, you know, there are polls done about. You know, where journalism professors in this country stand. And it's not like a 50-50 thing. You're right. In this country, we have about, I don't care which election you look at, certainly in this state, it's about 50-50. Somebody always wins, but they win with 52%. You know, relatively close. But the people who determine what we get in the news, it's not a 50-50 thing at all. We can't. And it's something frustrating that I have to deal with as well. And uh, I think we just have to get out the position of Donald Trump on different issues. He won an election, I think, on issues. I don't think he won the election by tweeting a lot. He won the election because the public agrees with him on business regulation. The public agrees with him on Supreme Court appointments. I think the public agrees with him on, on immigration. 
So is the goal to play down here, like on our part? We're taking questions as they're called here. I, I just, hey, come on. Abide by the rules. <laughs> How do we deal with the Republicans that want government-run health care? Um, I don't think, even among Democrats, Nancy Pelosi refuses to say she's for single payer. So you don't have Republicans say that. But it's apparent there are Republicans who are not dissatisfied with the system. And of course in Congress all you can do is vote for, the, for your senator or your congressman. Uh, obviously I think the voters of Alaska were probably disappointed in the vote of Lisa Murkowski a couple weeks ago and they'll have to decide how they're going to deal with it. Um, I think people in Arizona who voted for John McCain when his time around we're probably surprised and useful. But I think all they can do is they have to confront their individual congressmen or senators in their home states. I do think, by the way, the conservative media can do a better job of calling on me. Jim Genrich? Right here. Okay. That's about North Korea. Uh, what are the short and the long-term options for dealing with the short North Korea and its Chinese ally? It's very difficult. You're, you're hitting the most difficult topic. I assume when I get back next week, I will have another, sometime in September, another confidential briefing. Obviously, the easiest way to deal with it is if China would go as far as they can to isolate Korea economically and force them to get rid of these weapons. Um, the United States has done what they can economically on their own, and, and that's how I'll leave it. It's a very, very difficult topic. <clears throat> Foreign affairs is largely, but not exclusively, a presidential purview. Um, I think we just have to um, stick with Donald Trump. And I know they have had conversations with China that they've told us about to a degree. I don't know they've all been satisfied with what China's done. Um, but uh, I think to solve this problem without military action is going to require a lot of cooperation with the Chinese. Gene Majewski? Did I say that right? I'm sorry. What do you think about the wall? Uh, I was in Israel a while ago, and of course they have a wall, keeping people out, and the wall worked well. I think people are opposed to the wall. Are, if you really touch them, are really people who are satisfied with this. And any country that's going to continue to exist has to have immigration laws. Okay? For whatever reason, there are a surprising number of Americans who get confused between legal immigration and illegal immigration. But if we have illegal immigration, we are going to be getting here. We already have far too many people on the welfare in this country. We are going to be getting people here who come here for the welfare. I have talked to people in our criminal justice system. And there is no question we are getting people here who are committing crimes. Um, every immigrant who comes here should, insofar as we can do it, be a good immigrant. Okay? They should be somebody who is working hard. I think, was it John Adams who had some quote? Was it John Adams? My staff can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the United States is a, a constitution is built for a moral people and nobody else. And that's who we want to have come. The purpose of the wall is because the current system is not working. We are getting people here. Furthermore, if you stop and think about it, you have two people from a foreign country, and many of our immigrants are coming from south of the border. We'll pick a southern country. Costa Rica. If we pick two people from Costa Rica, and one person wants to come here illegally, and one person wants to fill out the forms, and go through the process, and go through whatever the waiting period is, I don't know what it's for six years, seven years to come here. 
who will make a better citizen? The one sneaking across the border or the one filling up? The one filling up. <laughs> if we have an entire open borders policy, eventually we will destroy America. So we have to enforce our immigration laws, and part of enforcing our immigration laws is a wall. Compared to the past, we have had so many administrations of both parties who apparently don't want to enforce those laws. But isn't that the problem? Yeah, right. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. That's people who will not enforce our laws. So that's what do you exactly. think the wall will it, do? I think the wall will make it easier to prevent people from coming in the country. Who should pay for it? Yeah. Yeah. How much money is it? Obviously make it more difficult for people to sneak in the country who don't want to see in the country. By the way, the other thing about the wall is not just preventing people from coming here who don't want to come in here. We have a huge opiate problem in this country, and a lot of that is coming across the border. The wall is designed to defend them from their enemies. Ron Heinrich, please. Ron Heinrich. Yeah, but he's wrong about the wall in Israel. You can't compare the two. Let's speak up a bit. Building a wall across, a feudal wall, you can call it, across Mexico, is not going to stop that illegal immigration. Most illegal immigration does not come across that border. As far as building a wall across that border, most illegal drugs are coming through, uh, in through trucks, through ports, through shipping containers, whatnot else. They're not being carried across the border in such strong measure. Gary, are you going to say something? Oh. Gary Clem? Oh. <clears throat> yeah, I have a different question than I have in there. What plan is there for the national debt, if any? Um, <laughs> in every budget since I've been there, there is a plan to work your way towards a balanced budget in 10 years. I am not going to lie to you, I am dissatisfied with those plans because a lot of those plans rely on future Congress to be responsible. And I've yet to see a Congress being responsible in the only year that really counts, which is next year. Um, I am on the Budget Committee. I am right now very dissatisfied with what <coughs> leadership <coughs> implies they expect us to vote on for the calendar year beginning October 1st. As I mentioned, Donald Trump and his budget spent less on military and less on non-military than what I think the House Republicans, House Republican leadership wants them to spend, which I think is very disappointing and probably the most disappointing thing I've had to put up with this year. About 70% of the federal budget is what we call mandatory spending, which is spending that is largely goes on whether or not Congress votes on it or not and that spending has to be addressed. For the first time in many years, this budget will begin to address the mandatory spending. In the proposal that's out there right now, they expect to cut spending by $200 billion over 10 years. That is not a big enough number at all. Um, it is a drop in the bucket, and of course most of that will be in the out years. Nevertheless, it shows, I think in part because of people like me pushing, um, it shows that Republican leadership gets they have to do something. They're just not moving anywhere near quick enough. And when I get back to Washington, I will do all I can to raise that number. It is very frustrating the degree to which, and I should blame the Democrats too, but I'll blame the Republicans here because I think when, you, when you vote Republican, I used to have a uh, I don't know who Dave Prosser was. He's the former Supreme Court judge, used to be Speaker of the Speaker of the House when I first got to Madison, or a year after I got to Madison. A very nice guy. He said the R stands for responsible. And right now, collectively, the Republicans in Congress do not have a responsible budget. And I tell them that as loud as anybody does when we have our closed door. We are so in debt. I mean, right now, 
we're borrowing, uh, it'll be 13 or 14 percent of next year's budget. When you're that, when the credit card is that through the roof, you don't want to borrow more. And I realize political reality is such that they are going to balance it. But too many Republicans are stuck in the now. And the reason we're in the mess we are in is in part individual appropriation bills have to be bipartisan. And the way you pass something bipartisan is you give everybody something what they want. That's part of the problem. But part of the problem is I don't care whether you're on the county board, the city, county, whatever. It's always easy to spend other people's money. And it's, the, it's a way to get reelected. You don't get people managed. And um, it's very frustrating the degree to which right now I do not believe the Republicans are as responsible as they should. We are not spending quite as much on, on defense as a lot of people wanted. I'll take credit for that, although it's still going up more than it should. Um, we are going after mandatory spending a little bit in this budget. It's nowhere near as much as it should be. The cut should be three times as much as it is, four times as much as it is. But I'll take credit for that because I'm one of the ones screaming as loud as anybody up there. I don't, some of the screaming is done with a microphone on and some behind closed doors. I, I can just assure you, when they close the doors, nobody is louder than me. Can the public get a copy of everything we're spending in the budget? Sure, sure. We, we, I don't know. We can get you kind of by department where it goes. We do not get as much detail as we should, which is another thing that we have to ask for in the future. One of the frustrating things about Washington, compared to Madison, and I can't help but compare the two because I work in both places, they give you much less information in Washington. As a matter of fact, the lack of information that Congress gets is appalling, compared to a state legislature. Paul Lindquist? Right here. Um, Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask about your current views of net neutrality and if they've changed since your boilerplate um, um, your response came out. I have not had a reason to look at it in the last few months, so I'll let them make comments. Fair enough. You may I ask if they you were here? But Barbara Reynolds. Here. Okay. Um, you're talking about budgets all the time, and President Trump has threatened to shut down the government yes. unless he gets his wall. Yes. Where are you going to get the money to pay for this wall that Mexico is supposed to pay for? Well, two comments. First of all, <laughs> if the budget is shut down, um, right now we appropriate no money beginning October 1st, okay? And there will be an appropriations bill passed by the House of Representatives by then. As I said, it takes 60 votes to pass something out of the Senate. So it really, the ball is in the Democrats' court as to whether or not they want to help pass the budget or not. It is apparent that Donald Trump may not sign an appropriation bill without money for the now, I think in the long run, I think a wall can save money. Okay, right now, we are paying for medical care for anybody who comes across the border. We have to. I mean, an emergency room in this country, anywhere in this country, can't refuse to get care. Okay, we are letting people into this country who are older people, much older people, who clearly are going to require more governmental assistance than they're able to kick in. Um, as I mentioned before, when I talk to members of law enforcement, they see law enforcement dollars going to areas in which we have illegal immigrants. But how do you balance the budget when you so, have to pay for that wall? I don't, you know. So, if we reduce illegal immigration, we will save money on many other areas. As far as whether the government gets shut down, I think that will depend whether or not we get assistance from the Democrat side, people want bipartisanship, as we work towards 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. And hopefully we'll get those 60 votes, but so either side has the ability to shut yep. down the government. Yeah. And I think it is wrong to put that on, on President Trump. Right. He said it. What's your vote? Well, what it means is, 
Immigrants cannot get health care coming across yes. the border. Uh, that is yes. the number one fact. They cannot get health care coming across the border. I, I will tell you Unless this. they are a refugee, they I, cannot I get health care. Did you sign up to uh, speak? Yeah. You call I'm them? not going to listen to lies. Yeah, well, That's I, I will tell If you go to Columbia St. Mary's over here, uh, to the emergency room, they aren't going to kick you out. Sandra Osborne, just very quickly. Sandra Osborne, I know, but very quickly, not all immigrants come from Mexico. Oh, shut up! I have a right to speak too. Same to you. And Repeat the um, question, please. I think President Trump has the most aggressive administration <coughs> as far as reigning out of control regulations uh, in America. My style reference. is I don't criticize my staff publicly, so that's my style. And everybody has their own style. That's not my style. Do you think it's worthwhile? Do you think it's working? I, I think his cabinet is doing a great job. I think his cabinet is a stronger and better cabinet, uh, not only than President Obama, but than either of President Bush's cabinet. All right, we have, we have time for one more question. David Sass? David Sass? No? Okay, all right, we'll give it another one. Marissa Levin? Yes. First of all, with all due respect to you, Congressman, uh, there are two differences between the walls, that the wall that President Trump wants to build and the wall in Israel. The wall in Israel protects Israel from its enemies who want to destroy Israel and wake Israel up for that. So, my question, getting back to my question, is about Planned Parenthood and funding. Um, I don't think, with all due respect, that you and all the other congressmen realize that Planned Parenthood takes care of women from all, all economic areas. And abortion is just a teeny tiny part of what they do. They care for women, they do cancer screenings, they care for women who cannot see a doctor anywhere else. This way they don't have to go to an ER for, for checks and they have been able to screen women and they found one woman who had cervical cancer. She would not have been able to find it anywhere else. So my question is, why is everybody so anti-Planned Parenthood when they are in fact really helping to care for women? You really had two comments, and I'll respond to the first one. Um, there are people who try to get into Israel probably because they're terrorists and they're enemies, but there are probably other people who try to get into Israel because Israel is a much stronger country economically than its surrounding countries. And you shouldn't stereotype and say everybody who's coming into Israel is a terrorist. They're not all terrorists. Excuse me. Excuse me. I didn't say that. I said that Israel is a much stronger country economically than its surrounding countries. The wall in Israel was built because, yes, the Palestinians can build tunnels. They find ways of getting into Israel. But there are other countries that are anti-Israel and want to see Israel wiped off the map. And as far as immigration in this country, they're not all coming from south of the border. There are people here who have come in on visas, student visas or green cards, and they stay beyond their visa has expired and they stay on, and that's an illegal alien. That's true, too. We have all sorts of people come so here. So that's the majority. And for the good of our country, we like to pick who's coming. I understand no. that. I understand that. My grandparents were immigrants that came to this country back in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And people come into this country because of persecution. Yes, they come in as refugees. But there are people who are here that were students 
or are still students or are working and that visa has expired, they have not gone to, re to renew it and they are here. They're, they're illegal aliens as well. I'll, I'll bring that up with our Homeland Security people. I'll tell them that I heard at this town hall that we want to round them up. I don't know. Uh, but I know there are people here illegally a variety of ways. With regard to Planned Parenthood and the idea that they do things <coughs> other than just abortions and other than birth control related things, I am aware of that. However, there are clinics and hospitals that accept Medicaid all over the country. Planned Parenthood, because yes, the bills are to define Planned Parenthood. And I'm not talking about abortion clinics that are being closed. I'm talking about Planned Parenthood centers that help women. They screen them. Yes, they're there for, for birth control, but they're there primarily for health issues, women's health issues. We're talking about government. I know Planned Parenthood does fundraising. You are free to give your charitable dollars to Planned Parenthood. I think a lot of people are appalled, including me, by the fact that they are the largest, largest abortion provider in the country. I think people don't like the fact that they're looking at the human growth and development curriculum that they push. It is apparent they don't have a problem um, giving birth control to very, very young women whose maybe parents would be appalled if they found out they were Planned Parenthood. So given their world view on these two issues, I don't think we have a problem with saying that if you want other medical care, you can get it from the tons, the, I don't know, dozens and dozens of hospitals or clinics. They won't give it to these women. And do you want to have, and there are, 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds having babies. And just because there are abortion rights doesn't mean that you have to have an abortion. And, and if you want to put your 13-year-old your girl or take me, you can do that. But a lot of people wouldn't like that. <laughs> now I tell you what I'm going to do. You said we're done. Yeah, yeah. Because they've been so good. <laughs> can we take two more? Tom Bullock. Can you think of a worse comment than I just had a comment. We keep talking about veterans' benefits uh, being an entitlement. And I want to disagree. Those are earned benefits. I I don't know what uh, constantly they're being called entitlements that and my concern is that they are never looked at as earned benefits and right. I, I think they'll look at it. I think we if you look in this budget as broke as we are, where we wind up there'll be a significant increase in the amount of money we spend on veterans, as there was last year. Um, I don't know anybody who right now they are what we call mandatory spending, and they should be mandatory spending. Because unlike some government spending that will stop if we do have a government shutdown, veterans' benefits should not stop. They should be mandatory spending where they automatically continue ahead. And I will be surprised in this budget if, I mean, obviously the final appropriation is going to be worked out in, in, in negotiations with the Democrats and the Senate will be involved. But I will be very surprised if we don't have a, another significant increase the amount of money spent on veterans, as we should. Bill Grady. Uh, I'm going to change the question I have on the card there uh, to this. I'm, I'm dismayed with the President's ability to tell the truth. Yes. Yes. One of the whoppers he told was the fact that he would have won the popular vote if three to five million illegal voters had not voted. So we now have this voter fraud commission, and I called your office, uh, Representative Grossman, about this uh, quite some time ago. And I said that I do not want one nickel of my tax dollars going to fund any commission or activities related to that uh, voter fraud. Uh, just a total waste of money. And I was told by your staff that you, you were on the budget committee and you would support not, uh, not funding that. However, I read recently that they got a half a million dollars of money to work with as they kicked off the commission. Uh, what are your comments on that? 
Well, I, I'm not sure what pot that money came out of. Right? You know what pot that money came out of? Yeah. It doesn't matter where it came from. But it does because you want to know, you know. What I don't want, to, as I said, I don't want a nickel of my tax dollars to fund. Well. Uh, There are people who, after every election, they complain that the person who is declared the winner is not the real winner. In this election, there are some Democrats who claim Donald Trump didn't win the election. I believe there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that wrong things happen. And I don't think paying people to look around and make sure there wasn't cheating going on is a bad use of government funds. Really? There's no evidence of voters? I think there may be. I get all the people come up to me and tell me things. I don't know if they're true. Be they in Wisconsin or other states in which it sure looks like people voted who shouldn't have voted. Now, maybe that's not true, but I don't think it's bad to have to do a study on this. You find out? You seem terribly uncomfortable. You should find out if they're cheating or not. I don't know who would object to that. We do studies on everything on this side. Finding out whether or not there's cheating you going on is not a bad thing. Why don't we do one more then? We'll, we got, we'll do one more then I'll hang around. You know? about the Foxconn investment in Wisconsin. How do you feel about that? She's talking about Foxconn. I wish we had Jim here. Jim is here. Can I tell her why you voted for Foxconn? That because I think it's a well-orchestrated deal. I think it's going to be a great benefit for the state of Wisconsin. I think it's going to produce a lot of jobs for our state. And. Uh, I think there's a lot of other states that are chomping at the bit to get, a, get at Foxconn. And what I'm hearing from other states is not, hey, this is great that we didn't take this deal. They're complaining that their legislators and governors did not make a good enough incentive package to Foxconn to go to those states. So I think Foxconn is going to be a great benefit. Jim, where's the 200 million per okay. year going to come from? It's going to come from. Foxconn's taxes that they pay, we're not No, they don't pay taxes. Tax. They don't pay tax. There's no, there's no taxes on the manufacturer. We're not putting money up front. They have to produce the jobs. We don't have $200 million a year to pay to give to them as corporate wealth. He's not hearing you. Okay, I'll tell you why. Is this is right, Ken, after three. Is that yeah. uh, I have one announcement to make, too, before we wrap up. I see a lot of you put your email addresses on these. Um, if you would like to... To receive the congressman's e-newsletter, there's a box on the bottom of this. We cannot send it to you unless you check the box. So if you do want to receive his e-newsletter, if you could come see me, and we can make sure that box is checked on your thing. It is just congressional rules. I'm sorry, but I do need to get that check mark if you want to receive it. Okay, I am not going to race out of here. I'll probably leave it about 15 minutes. So, if you want to come up to me and. Thank you.